Sindri. Oh wow, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, only 16. <laughs> okay, I'll mute you all for now. Uh, I'll just unmute uh, Yekaterina and uh, that's it. Should I share my screen? And uh, not yet. Let's uh -huh. just wait for, for everyone else to join because people are still coming. Okay. Yeah, so everyone is just connecting their audios and everything. Let's wait a couple minutes. Okay, hello everyone. If you can hear me, please put a plus in the chat. Uh -huh, okay, thank you. One plus, anyone else? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Tamara Plus, thank you. Okay, great. So you can uh, hear me. Perfect. Artem, uh, thank you very much. So let's uh, start. I'm very happy to see all of you. Some people are still joining, but our presentation will be, well, my presentation will be very short. My name is uh, Katerina Kafka Weber, and I'm the co-founder of TK Lingua Online English. We have been working with veterinarians since 2019 and I really like you guys. I think you're amazing. So we just wanted to give you a little bit more of real life experience and uh, the ability to listen to conferences in English and to give talks in English. So uh, the first uh, speaker today is uh, Yekaterina Novikova, who is going uh, to share a fantastic presentation about rats. <laughs> okay, Yekaterina, you're welcome. You can start. Okay, can you see? First, first I, um, I want to say that it's a not scientific report. Uh, this presentation is merely my experience, my clinical experience, maybe my opinion. And uh, you know, rats are laboratory animals. And um, mm, some neoplasms are induced by researcher. Um, this type of neoplasm is uh, not spontaneous, but we will discuss spontaneous tumors. Um, uh, these tumors have a natural origin. Um, what is a pet rats? It is pet so. No, uh -huh. you know, rats um, have a lot of different neoplasms, different tumors. Um, for example, memory tumors, soft tissue sarcomas, um, adenocarcinomas, uh, pituitary adenomas. But um, there is a little information about spontaneous pancreatic tumors in pet rat. Um, for example, ferrets. There are plenty of information about uh, insulinomas in uh, ferrets. And um, there are some reports about um, insulinomas in uh, guinea pigs. Uh -huh. And, um, but I think uh, that um, pancreatic tumors are very rare tumors in the red. For example, pituitary adenoma is the most common tumor among endocrine neoplasms in red. Um, you can see it, um, I can see it every, every my working day, one or three reds with pituitary adenoma. Uh, but uh, rats with um, pancreatic tumors, I can see maybe 
six or seven rats in a year. And you can see, for example, in aged fisher, 3,044 males, it's lib. Rats, uh, pituitary adenomas reach 20.5% um, and pancreatic uh, cell adenomas only 6.5%. What is a pancreatic tumor? You know, of course you know. It's abnormal proliferation and replication of cells within a pancreas. Here you can see, uh, can you see my um, arrow? Oh no, pointer, pointer. Mm -hmm, yes, uh, you can see two nodules in the pancreas. Uh, on the left, you can see a part of stomach it's a duodenum, and here a right lobe of uh, the pancreas. Here one nodule, and the second one. And uh, of course you know that uh, pancreas uh, is a mixed or heterocrine uh, gland. It has both uh, endocrine uh, and exocrine function. So of course uh, we can we can see two types of pancreatic tumors: exocrine tumors that originate from endocrine cells, and endocrine tumors that originate from endocrine cells. And uh, there are two types of the exocrine tumors: benign adenomas, malignant adenocarcinomas, and um, in dogs and cats. Adenocarcinomas are um, much more common than adenomas. But what about reds? We are lacking information about exocrine tumors in reds. Um, maybe they exist, but <laughs> we don't have uh, enough information. And uh, there are three types of the endocrine tumors, insulinomas, gastrinomas, and glucagonomas. And um, again, there is lack of information. We have, uh, we, we don't have enough information about different types of, of, the, of the endocrine tumors in rats. And the science of pancreatic tumors depend on the type of tumors, of course. Insulinoma. And uh, you know, that insulin insulinoma is um, insulin secreting beta cell tumor, and um, excessive secretion of the hormone insulin lead to hyperinsulinemia and hypoglycemia. And that's why we can see next uh, clinical signs. We can see weight loss, we can see lethargy, and of course behavioral changes. Um, red can, can be sad, sleepy maybe, maybe aggressive. We can see incoordination. Um, sometimes I think very often we can see muscle twitching, uh, particularly hamstring muscles. Hamstring muscles, um, it's a group of, um, of the posterior, posterior thigh muscles, muscles between, uh, between hip and knee. And uh, you can see this twitching or you can uh, palpate it. And we can see weakness, especially posterior weakness. Uh, red, um, red moves um, using four, um, four legs. Uh, not often, but we can see seizures and collapse. And in some cases, uh, I saw hematuria. But I'm not sure that uh, hematuria connects with um, Insulinoma. Maybe it's uh, idiopathic uh, hematuria of rats.
I don't know. Hi. No, no video. <laughs> Oh, it's a, it's a seizure. <laughs> yes. Fred is in Yelena. Diagnostic procedure. Of course, clinical history. We can, we should ask symptoms. Uh, when does it start? Um, was it uh, acute or onset, onset or no? Uh, we should um, examine um, movements, conscious, um, perform neurological examination, auscultation, palpation, of course. And um, if the nodule into the pancreas half of centimeters or, or centimeter, you can palpate it. And of course, uh, we should uh, check serum glucose level and um, the literature recommend us to check serum insulin concentration and thoracic radiography, abdominal ultrasonography, renal disease or histopathology, if we could. In our clinic from January, 2013 to June 2021, uh, we examined uh, 24 more, more than 24,000 rats, pet rats, and uh, only 34 rats had pancreatic tumors. And all these rats had clinical signs of hypoglycemia. And um, we based on clinical signs and serum glucose level to predict this diagnosis, dia diagnosis, uh, diagnosis um, insulinoma. Um, because um, we couldn't um, perform all, all researchers because uh, it is very, very expensive. And our presumptive diagnosis was a beta cell neoplasia or insulinoma. And most of rats um, were over two years old and um, at the time of the first examination, and only six were females. And most of them were intact males. I don't know why, uh, maybe because uh, castration is, uh, is a rare procedure, rare surgery in the rats. All rats had a behavioral changes and weakness. And all these rats had a hypoglycemia. And other symptoms were very different. Some rats were aggressive, some rats had um, and uh, in my opinion, I use a normal serum glucose level, 2.77 to 7.49 millimole per liter from Carpenter. And I don't measure serum All rats, all rats had chronic respiratory disease, hepatitis, uh, peripheral polyneuropathy, pituitary tumors, maybe adenoma. We didn't um, perform um, necropsy. Osteoarthritis, and one rat had a tumor of the left adrenal gland, and uh, three female rats had memory gland tumors 
and pododermatitis, and the Tourette's had a demodicosis. And um, we use two types of treatment, surgical treatment and medical treatment. Surgical treatment um, was laparotomy and uh, partial pancreatectomy. And uh, four rats undergo surgery treatment, but unfortunately all rats after surgery died in two days. Um, All rats after surgery had the complications. Complications um, um, in um, blood glucose level. Uh, level of glucose rose and um, fell sharply. For example, before surgery, we measured um, cell glucose and it was um, 1.4 millimol per, per liter. Uh, in 10 minutes after surgery, 13 millimol per liter. In 20 minutes after surgery, 20. In one hour, 34. Uh, we try um, to, to increase it. But uh, then uh, serum glucose level um, fell uh, to 0 0.5, for example, and red died. Um, medical treatment. We use it uh, in uh, we use it in 26 reds, and uh, life expectancy was from two weeks to six months and i think it's it is, it is better than surgical treatment and one red died before starting treatment and uh, three reds were euthanized before starting treatment we used a different regime of medications um, uh, in some cases we use prednisolone only in some cases, we use, we use prednisolone plus diethoxide. In some cases, the dexamethasone only and dexamethasone plus diethoxide. And in all cases, um, we use um, glucose blood level um, to milligrams per kilograms. But you know, diethoxid is not register, registered in our country. So the cost of diethoxid very, very expensive. And some owners couldn't buy this drug. And for example, <laughs> Some cases of pathological study, only five pathological studies. In four cases, adenoma of the pancreas was identified. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't know is it uh, glucagonoma or insulinoma because um, we should we should stain with a special special material, special um, <laughs> stain, special stain <laughs> to, to identify, uh, is it um, insulinoma or it's glucagonoma. And in one case, metastasis of uh, pheochromocytoma, the left adrenal gland was identified. And in 29 cases, unfortunately, on a CFU's pathological study, because of course, 
and here you can see metastasis of fewer chromocytoma. It's very interesting for me, for example. Uh, you can see huge nodule close to spleen. And um, on the right, you can see left kidney and huge left adrenal gland. It's bigger than the left kidney. So we can uh, summarize. Um, pancreatic tumors among pet rats are very, very rare. And the most of affected rats are aged male over two years old. And nodules in the pancreas were detected in all cases. Uh, we can palpate it. Uh, we, we can palpate it. And uh, we can always discover it on ultrasound. And adenoma was um, identified in four cases. And metastasis of theochromocytoma only in one case. But unfortunately, 29 cases um, were a lack of <laughs> pathological study. Or lacking maybe. And um, in my opinion, only in my opinion, uh, medical treatment uh, was uh, more successful than surgical treatment. And that's all. Okay, Yekaterina, thank you very much. Uh, I think it was very useful and um, a great experience of speaking English. <laughs> it's not always easy, but I think you did great. Thank you. Uh, so if anyone has a question, uh, you have a couple of minutes to ask them. If you want Yekaterina to answer. And uh, Daria, you can unmute your microphone and start preparing. Okay, I don't think uh, anyone has questions. Maybe everything was clear. So um, if you want, um, oh, what about cats and dogs? Um, today's conference yeah. is not really about cats and dogs, but Yekaterina, if you <laughs> want, you can answer. I, uh, I can't answer because uh, I work with exotic animals. So I can answer only about red. Yeah, uh, today's conference oh, is about exotic animals, so maybe about cats and dogs. Um, Alina, if you are interested, um, maybe we can find uh, someone else who can talk about it. Okay, no problem. Uh, thank you. All right, uh, and um, our second speaker is Daria Frasolova, who is going to talk about also fantastic animals, I think. All right, Daria, you can start. Thank you. Uh, have you seen my presentation? It's work okay? Oh. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dalia and I work as an exotic pet veterinarian in St. Petersburg. Uh, and today I want to, to speak a little bit uh, with you about a very interesting theme. Uh, it's called Nutritional Secondary Hypoparathyroidism in Helenium species. And I don't know uh, how I think about pronouncing this word almost in every slide of my first English con uh, conference, but uh, I would try to do it because uh, it's a really um, common condition in our uh, colonia patients and uh, we see it uh, rather often and it needs to be discussed in a few words. Uh, and we will start with the definition, uh, what is this? Uh, and the term of nutritional secondary hypoparathyroidism refers to the activity of parathyroid gland and as a result of hypocalcemia or inadequate nutrition or an appropriate husbandry. And we all know that uh, husbandry related conditions uh, are quite often seen in reptile species. Not only about, it's not only about colonials, uh, but uh, about all the reptiles that we've seen in our clinics. Uh, so nutritional secondary 
hyperparadigm is the most uh, common nutritional disorder of all captive uh, colonials. And uh, it's commonly refers to as metabolic bone disease, but it's not quite the right term because we can say that metabolic bone disease is or, uh, also an osteomalacia or other mm, diseases that can be referred as metabolic bone disease, but it's not only NSHP. Uh, so when we're speaking about a very disease, we're speaking, of course, about causes that uh, can be related to the disease. Uh, and as for NSHP, it is insufficient dietary calcium. It is insufficient dietary vitamin D3 for carnivorous species. Uh, it is inappropriate calcium or phosphorus ratio, uh, insufficient ultraviolet B lighting, uh, and suboptimal temperatures. And of course, uh, all these uh, causes are re closely related to husbandry and nutrition, but also we should say that uh, every pathology of the kidneys, liver, or GI tract, parathyroid gland can also lead to nutritional hyperthyroidism. Um, and a few words about vitamin D, ultraviolet light and the heat, because it's very important to all the reptiles and uh, it is, um, mm, and the thing that differentiates uh, reptiles patient from our beloved uh, cats and dogs. Uh, so vitamin D3 uh, is the hormone necessary for intestinal absorption of calcium and phosphorus. Uh, we all know that and uh, it's uh, not differs from other patients. Uh, in re some reptiles um, are unable to obtain vitamin D solely from dietary sources. Uh, it is more about herbivores um, and less about carnivores. So they can obtain some vitamin D from their prey. Uh, Helothermic reptiles uh, rarely on basking in natural sunlight to synthesize their own vitamin D3 through processes involving light and heat. And uh, then we would uh, discuss a little bit these processes. And we start with the process of vitamin D synthesis and calcium absorption. It is a quick, uh, um, a few words uh, just to understand how it's related to calcium level. Um, reptiles need special spectrum of uh, UVB light to, uh, to make changes in the structure of pro-vitamin D. Uh, uh, they have special precursors in the skin that contains pro-vitamin D3. Uh, and then uh, with heat, uh, vitamin D3 is thermochemically isomerized to cholecalciferol. Uh, and this process uh, um, both in the skin and hardly depend on the heat. Uh, Holocalciferol is not the biologically active form of vitamin D um, and uh, doesn't uh, um, uh, make uh, the absorption of calcium in the intestines. And uh, so holocalciferol is uh, uh, hydroxylated in the liver to calcidol and then into the kidneys to calcitrol. Uh, and uh, the calcitrol is a biologically active form of vitamin D3 and uh, it promotes absorption of dietary calcium from the intestines. Um, uh, calcium uh, homeostasis is regulated by three main hormones. It is calcitriol uh, or vitamin D3 active form. Uh, it is parathyroid gland hormone and it is calcitonin. And uh, the effects and the regulation of these hormones is summarized here in this table. I wouldn't say too much about this. You can just look and um, to have a quick um, look about um, dealing with these hormones in the organism of the reptile. Uh, and we go in um, 
um, forward to the pathophysiology, um, when the reptile have a low level of ionized calcium in the blood, uh, it is stimulate the parathyroid gland to release the parathyroid hormone. The parathyroid hormone causes calcium to be released from bones into the bloodstream and normalize calcium levels. Uh, the then renal tubular absorption of calcium is increased, phosphorus excretion is increased, and active vitamin D3 is released from the kidneys to stimulate calcium absorption in the intestines. Um, and the, one of the most um, uh, hard conditions is osteomalacia, when uh, uh, we have a very low level of serum calcium, and uh, our bones are born to uh, this condition, and it's very, it has very poor prognosis for all our patients. Um, as for clinical signs, what we can see in an uh, animal with NSHP, uh, we could see swollen, cleavable, or misshapen jaw. Uh, the animal can be anorexic. Um, uh, it could be a uh, shunted crow, or in Heloniers, we often see uh, deformities of the shell, or sometimes uh, disproportion of the shell, like uh, the pit like in the turtles on the picture. Uh, of course, we could see sometimes pathological fractures of uh, bones, uh, fibrous osteodystrophy as a response to low calcium level, uh, problems with lifting the body off the ground when the animal is walking. And uh, when we're um, looking at the animals, it's like a swimming move about young animals, um, it is um, um, the disease that caused, um, it is, uh, <clears throat> however, we couldn't uh, think that it's only deal with the NHSP because um, uh, in most uh, cases there would be a secondary infection. So, bacterial or uh, um and reproductively active females, uh, they are most often developing the symptoms on NSHP. Uh, prolapses of the internal organs, uh, of course, calcium also take part in the muscle construction and all, all the processes that need to um, be related with the muscle construction. And the history and clinical signs are often enough to uh, confirm uh, the diagnosis, but um, in some cases we need to do an extra diagnostic to all this and conditions, of course and talking. Uh, sometimes we need CBC or chemistry panel to, sc uh, to screen for underlying disease. Uh, and uh, the most important for us in the chemical panel would be plasma calcium and phosphorus levels. Um, they may help us to differentiate NSHP from renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. And uh, since phosphorus is elevated and calcium remains with normal range, um, in most courses, uh, it would be problems of the renal system. Uh, of course, we should remember in every case that a total blood calcium level within the normal range of the species does not rule out of NSHP. Uh, so in the uh, early stages when uh, our parathyroid hormone takes our calcium to the bloodstream, the total blood calcium level would be okay in the normal range and we should remember this. And that's why uh, we often diagnose the uh, disease in the 
very very um, uh, less dangerous and it's bad uh, so of course bad for animals but to diagnose uh, this uh, uh, condition at um, not at the last stages we could perform the ionized calcium uh, an um, analysis so uh, it will provide us a more accurate assignment of reptile calcium status um, and sometimes we perform radiographs uh, it's we needed to evaluate bone density uh, and we often would see osteopenia or low bone density. Uh, it is often generalized and characterized by uh, increased radial and so the bones like uh, here in the picture. Potential, but uh, we also should remember that we will see anything only if the if it in the process detect. So it's uh, also a valuable tool to detect uh, underlying conditions such as constipation or bloating, dystocia follicular status or disorders that uh, can occur to secondary low calcium levels. And a few words about treatment, of course. The most uh, important thing is to provide the proper nutrition and husbandry. And uh, it is always worth speaking about is this UV light, is this temperature, is this diet. And uh, uh, in most cases, it would be enough to treat uh, NSHP uh, um, when it, it's not uh, related to the last uh, uh, conditions. Uh, so uh, sometimes we need to manage uh, hypocalcemia and to um, give animal uh, dietary calcium. As for injectable calcium, it is quite questionable uh, because of uh, the increased absorption in the intestines and uh, not so uh, good uh, absorption from injections. But when we have very, very low calcium levels, we could think about making inject injectable calcium. Um, oral vitamin D supplementation is generally recommended, but um, we should always think about the animal that we are wanted to treat with the vitamin D and for some animals uh, uh, oral vitamin D would be toxic. Um, it's more about uh, iguanas, not helonias, uh, but we should remember this and remember that uh, herbivorous animals are not uh, are ready to obtain vitamin D from their uh, uh, from the plants that they eat and it's not uh, so useful for treating them with vitamin D. Um, but of course, we need more um, information about this in uh, herbivorous species and maybe in some days we would have it. And of course, in most cases, in the last stages, we need stabilization and supportive care for our patients. Uh, sometimes uh, it is fluid therapy or uh, um, we need to perform um, feeding to animals and we can uh, take uh, at the phagostomy or um, any other supportive care procedures. Um, and the most important thing in treating NSHP is uh, the length of treatment. It would be very long treatment, and I mean very, very, very long treatment. Uh, when we're speaking about colonias, it's not about uh, treatment would be not about months or uh, one month. Uh, it would be two, uh, three, five, six months, or even years. And the owner should uh, understand it when it, uh, he wants, he or she wants to treat their animal. 
And as a conclusion, I would like to say that NSHP can be caused by various factors related to inappropriate husbandry or diet, and clinical science and history in many cases enough to suspect the diagnosis. Uh, in, other, um, in other times, we can perform plasma calcium and phosphorus levels. It could be useful, especially uh, in differentiating from renal secondary hyperparathyroidism. And our treatment most re relies on correlation of husbandry and dietary factors that um, associated with supportive care, management of secondary underlying conditions, and consume supplementation. Uh, the prognosis for these animals is generally poor and management often requires uh, financial and emotional investment. It, it is fine for the owners to understand and welfare of our patients should be considered and euthanasia recommended in some cases where we have the last stages of NSHP. And thank you all for your attention and time. Uh, if you have some questions, I would be glad to answer. And Daria, thank you very much. And uh, my recommendation to everyone here is to follow Daria on Instagram because your Instagram is just amazing. <laughs> um, Daria, thanks. Your presentation was great. Oh, uh, thanks. <laughs> So I don't see any questions right now. So uh, if anyone um, wants later, then they can probably message you privately. And yeah. our next uh, speaker is uh, Yusuf from Lebanon. So Yusuf, you can unmute yourself and you're welcome. <laughs> we are shy. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. <laughs> um, Yusuf, we can't hear you at the moment. Oh, yes, no, it's working. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Okay, so my uh, I'm a fourth year veteran. I'm a surgeon's assistant at I, uh, IVC MVA and soy Dr. Lublin of Moscow. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you about congenital dental disease of incisors and rabbits. Let's get started. Okay, so. Um, okay, so first of all, let's get to know a little bit about uh, rabbit anatomy, rabbit's mouth anatomy. Uh, rabbits have uh, two types of teeth, uh, incisors and cheek teeth. Incisors help uh, rabbits grab and cut. Uh, greens and vegetations and uh, cheek teeth help uh, the rabbits grind and uh, make the greens and their food to smaller particles in order for them to digest easily. Uh, rabbits have uh, very uh, interesting uh, teeth. They have illidon dentation, which means their uh, roots are not like uh, dogs and cats. They are open uh, and they allow them to grow all the time. So if uh, we cut the teeth, they will grow again. Um, so they constantly grow since every day. <laughs> um, they have 28 uh, teeth in total, six incisors, 10 uh, premolars and 12 molars. Why do we care so much about rabbit dentistry? Because uh, Dental disease in rabbits is very common and we see it almost every day. Uh, dental disease is caused by malocclusion. And uh, what is malocclusion? It's a very weird word and uh, very little people know what it, what is it. Uh, malocclusion basically is uh, the abnormal uh, occlusion of uh, rabbit teeth. So uh, I, will, I will talk about this later uh, using x-rays, um, but it's basically bad lining up of normal teeth or bad meeting of the teeth. What causes malocclusion? Um, malocclusion could be traumatic and atraumatic. Traumatic, uh, which means some sort of trauma that happened in uh, the rabbit's life, uh, to its uh, skull, uh, which caused a 
tooth fracture or jaw fracture. And uh, after this trauma, the rabbit's teeth will grow abnormally and will cause malocclusion and dental disease. Um, atraumatic, it could be congenital, which means the rabbit was born with this disease, uh, genetically deformed, for example, uh, or it could be dietary, which means they have calcium or vitamin D deficiency in their, in their daily uh, food ratio. Uh, this is uh, a lateral x-ray of a rabbit, rabbit skull, and here we can see here we can see the normal occlusion of the maxillar and mandibular uh, incisors. Meanwhile, if we look at the abnormal occlusion, we see how the uh, maxillar and the mandibular uh, incisors, they don't meet, which means malocclusion, bad meeting. There's three uh, uh, ways to treat my dental disease or malocclusion in rabbits. Uh, the golden standard, as uh, one of my colleagues like to call it, is uh, extraction. Um, so it is the golden standard, and uh, I agree. Uh, we extract the teeth. I will talk about this later. Uh, trimming the teeth and uh, reverse occlusion. Uh, teeth extraction. Um, after the animal is anesthetized, uh, we use a uh, number 11 blade and we try to remove the gingia from the rabbit's teeth and uh, try to um, delitate the, uh, the tooth from the ging uh, gingiva. Uh, after that, we, uh, we use our uh, lexator uh, in order to try to, to, wiggle, to wiggle the tooth away from, uh, basically from the skull or from the mandible. Um, basically we, we put pressure on the tooth, not too much uh, so that we won't break it, just enough so we can remove it from the skull. After we make sure that all the ligaments are freed, uh, we, I usually use a hemostat, um, we grab the teeth with a hemostat and we, uh, with a rotational movement, we remove uh, the teeth from the uh, rabbit. Uh, the risk of this, and uh, this, the, the very, the biggest risk in this step is breaking the teeth. Uh, we have to make sure that we have enough pressure to hold the tooth and not break it. After we remove the tooth, we use um, a needle in order to destroy it so that it won't uh, regrow. As, as we said, they are, the, the teeth are constantly growing. And uh, in order for them not to grow, we have to destroy the alveoli of the tooth. Um, and we're done. Um, Always make sure to flush before and after uh, extraction of the teeth. Uh, what else, what else? Uh, basically, we, we never suture if there's uh, infection or uh, uh, any sort of infection in the rabbit's mouth or skull area, we never suture. Trimming. Uh, trimming is very common in our practice. Uh, of the tooth to make it short, to shorten it. And then we try to basically uh, model the, the tooth to look more like normal. And we, we two to four weeks, and we use our uh, diamond, diamond burr. It's a diamond disc. Basically, uh, reverse occlusion. Honestly, I've never used this method before, but uh, it's very interesting to me. It uh, it sounds like braces for human. Um, basically, we reshape the, the teeth in order for them to look uh, more more like normal, uh, and 
we repeat this uh, three to six times every seven days, like one like three to six times every week. Um, what else should I tell you more about this? There's um, only and st statistics statistically there's only forty percent uh, success using this procedure. Uh, basically, that's it. That's all I have for you guys today. I spoke. I, I think I spoke really fast. <laughs> okay, um, so thank you very much. Anyway, uh, so you uh, had a couple of questions, but I think uh, Marina has answered them. Anyway. Uh, if you have anything to add, maybe you can talk about it. So um, Alina asked, uh, how do they live in the wild with this problem? Uh, I don't think rabbits uh, live that long in the wild in order for them to have this problem. And they are basically genetically correct uh, more than the domestic rabbits um, because um, breeders get, uh, usually inbreed and that's where we find problems in uh, most animals because uh, breeders inbreed and uh, we find these problems here in our practice. I would also, I would also like to thank Marina uh, Kuzmichuk for her help. Uh, I used all her pictures. Um, so thank you, Marina. Okay, Yusuf, thank you very much. Um, it was quite interesting, you know, even for me, <laughs> and I'm not a vet. <laughs> right, and thank Alina, you. thank you for your question. Right, and um, last but not least, um, our next speaker is Marina Kazimirchuk. Um, so uh, I will mute Yusuf, and uh, Marina, you can start your presentation. Oh, Yusuf, could you stop sharing your screen, please? Uh, Yusuf, could you um, stop your screen share, please? Oh, um, yeah. Oh, Marina is starting. Okay, great. When we speak, because when we speak with veterinarians to discuss, <clears throat> because uh, our, we, we don't have our ways to exchange information. So don't be shy. And if you want something to ask, when ask. If I will not know the answer, I will socially. Uh, some months ago, I was invited to a uh, human experimental labor, uh, laboratory. Uh, we have a task to induce uh, tuber uh, tuberculosis meningoencephalitis in uh, rabbits. They used uh, meat rabbits. Uh, it's, it is really important for human medicine because HIV positive people, uh, they uh, die really fast and uh, really uh, we die really fast because of uh, tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis, uh, meningoencephalitis. Uh, so it is important for us to help them uh, to uh, infect the rabbits so we can try to treat them and maybe uh, in future we will have uh, good options for uh, human medicine. Uh, so I came to the lab laboratory and uh, uh, took some samples of uh, liquor for PCR. Uh, and <coughs> sorry, and when I injected uh, TB culture inside the uh, cisterna magna, uh, it wasn't really it wasn't really you know, difficult task, uh, it, and, it, and uh, I don't know if I can do it or not. So I succeeded, and uh, in one month uh, we organized with rabbits make an autopsy and we succeeded uh, in uh, our task because uh, these rabbits have histo histologically uh, positive uh, meningoencephalitis and uh, 
uh, some rabbits uh, had uh, systemic disease and uh, on uh, uh, the picture with lungs you can see white foci it's uh, uh, human tuberculosis in rabbit it was uh, the first time in my life when I saw the autopsy with uh, tuberculosis positive animal uh, so uh, I just started to think uh, why they use rabbits uh, is it really important for us or not so that's why I uh, cho have chosen this uh, subject to discuss with you today <coughs> uh, so uh, uh, you know that spontaneous mycobacteriosis is rare both in domestic animals uh, when we speak about rodents and rabbits and uh, in wild <coughs> But they use uh, rabbits uh, as experimental models uh, uh, for many, many uh, long time, and uh, uh, they are really good experimental models. So we can infect rabbit, and he will get a disease. Uh, that's why we can think that uh, these uh, these animals can be a reservoir between wildlife, domestic animals, and humans. We should remember that. Uh, uh, we use rabbits not only as pets but also for meat and we can eat with say rabbits and uh, in some countries uh, rabbits are like synanthropic animals <coughs> like we have rats for example or cats in our cities uh, so it can be really important and uh, uh, the, our problem is that we lack information in our traditional sources so we don't know much about this disease uh, when I was studying in uh, academy, uh, we don't we didn't speak about this disease. We speak about mycobacteriosis in our species, uh, including agricultural species, but uh, not rabbits. <coughs> uh, so when we are looking for information uh, in our so-called traditional sources, uh, we don't have much. Uh, we can we can see um, BSAV manual of rabbit medicine and uh, we have only one mentioning of this disease and uh, in uh, our pink book it's ferrets rabbits and rodents clinical medicine and surgery we have a few phrases about mycobacteriosis but i think it's not enough for us to know about this because uh, people can get this infection from uh, uh, from uh, rabbits and rodents and uh, this disease has a really good uh, zoonotic potential and we should know more about this. Uh, <coughs> when we speak about mycobacteria, uh, we should remember that genus mycobacterium, it's not one bacteria uh, which can cause tuberculosis in humans, as ordinary people used to think, but it's more than 150 species of bacteria. And these bacteria are both obligate and opportunistic pathogens. <clears throat> and when we speak about uh, pathogens for humans, we can divide, uh, divide all mycobacteria into three big groups. Now, the first group is uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis complex, and in English literature we can read MTBC. Uh, from this group we should remember about three mycobacteria. It's my Mycobacterium tuberculosis, so-called classical one, Mycobacterium bovis. Uh, we also speak about uh, speak about this a lot in our academies. And uh, and the third one is Mycobacterium capra. It's not that popular, uh, but uh, uh, rabbits uh, can get this infection, so we will speak about this later. Uh, the second group is non-tuberculous mycobacteria, also called atypical mycobacteria and uh, NTM. And uh, from this <coughs> uh, group, uh, we should remember about mycobacterium avium complex, so MAC, and mycobacterium genovense. And the third group is really small, and uh, uh, it consists of mycobacteria, which cause uh, leprosy in humans. Leprosy is prokaza. It's a rare disease for today, and uh, uh, it uh, can be caused by Mycobacterium lepre. And some authors think that Mycobacterium lepromatis uh, is also important. Uh, so let's start with leprosy. <coughs> uh, 
uh, a good news that we don't have uh, published cases of natural leprosy in uh, rabbits, both domestic and wild. Uh, and rabbits are really bad experimental model. Uh, they try to use them, but uh, since 1970s they don't uh, do it. Uh, uh, because we have uh, be uh, because we have uh, better animals to to use in experiments. Uh, when they tried to use rabbits, they <coughs> inoculate uh, inocul inoculated uh, uh, bacteria into the anterior eye chamber, and uh, it was uh, the only option for them to be infected. And right now, they, they use rabbits uh, only to produce polyclonal antibodies uh, to make diagnostic tests for humans. Uh, it's very strange for me because when I was younger, I, I listened to crematorium music and uh, I know about uh, this disease from a song. <laughs> and uh, right now, I'm speaking on the conference about uh, lab in uh, when let's talk about mycobacterium tuberculosis complex uh, and the good news uh, are that we don't have reported cases of tuberculosis in pet rabbits but uh, maybe it's not a uh, it doesn't mean that rabbits can get uh, cannot get tuberculosis it can be uh, the situation where we lack informational sources uh, or maybe we don't know about this disease, so we uh, don't do uh, the diagnostic tools. Uh, we don't use diagnostic tools to confirm the diagnosis. So maybe rabbits can get, but we don't know. Uh, because we have a lot of patients which uh, dies before the diagnosis. And uh, when we speak about exotic pet medicine, uh, unfortunately, it's a really common situation. Uh, some of the uh, authors think that uh, rabbits are naturally resistant to infection with mycobacterium bovis, and we have only few reports about this. Uh, but rabbits is a really, ah, they're really good <coughs> experimental model, uh, and they uh, uh, use uh, rabbits uh, in laboratories uh, throughout the world uh, really extensively. And from this uh, group, we should uh, know about Mycobacterium capre. Uh, we don't, I, as I remember, we don't, didn't speak about this Mycobacterium in uh, university, but we should know it about when we speak about rabbits, because we have uh, one interesting case report from Spain, uh, from the farm of meat rabbits. Uh, these animals had a progressive weight loss and generalized weakness, and uh, after autopsy, uh, they found uh, multifocal white nodules uh, in uh, different internal organs, including lungs, kidney, and others. Uh, so, uh, and they confirmed the diagnosis uh, using acid uh, fast stains and PCR. <coughs> Uh, and uh, this is a problem because, uh, you know, uh, in Spain, meat rabbits and in Russia, meat rabbits, uh, I think that if we have these problems uh, in uh, Russia, for example, maybe the diagnosis was, uh, will not be confirmed uh, because it's, it's Russia. Uh, so uh, I'm scared a little bit about this because uh, it is an important situation. Uh, for, for us. And uh, humans can get mycobacterium copper infection. Uh, and it will be like a mycobacterium bovis infection uh, in humans. Uh, and uh, usually it's extra pulmonary disease. Uh, so when we speak about uh, lung tuberculosis in humans, uh, it's one disease. And when we speak about extra pulmonary disease, it's another one. And uh, in these cases, uh, sometimes, uh, even in human medicine, we have problems with diagnose, diagnosis. And uh, uh, so right now is the time for our third group of mycobacteria. 
Uh, maybe it's the most interesting group for us because uh, from this group we have uh, clinical cases, clinical reports in domestic animals. Uh, first of all, uh, we should speak about Mycobacterium avium infection in pygmy rabbits. Pygmy rabbits are not Arctolabrus cuniculi, as our traditional European rabbit, uh, but they are closely related to it. And uh, these rabbits are native to North America. Uh, when we will speak about Mycobacterium avium subspecies hominisuis, it's a Mycobacterium important for humans and pigs. And when uh, Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis, it's Mycobacteria important for cattle. Uh, but uh, rabbits uh, uh, are important reservoir for this Mycobacterium in the nature, and so they can. Uh, give uh, mycobacteria uh, to cows and when we will eat these cows and uh, the last one is mycobacterium genovense which we know about uh, <coughs> when we speak uh, which we discuss when we speak about bird medicine and uh, reptile medicine uh, this is a picture of pygmy rabbit uh, it is uh, uh, closely re related to Rectalagus cuniculi, and this interesting fact is uh, that uh, uh, close to 40% of this rabbit died because of mycobacteriosis, and uh, uh, they usually think that it's because of uh, 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 immune function deficiency, and uh, they get uh, di disseminated mycobacteriosis. <clears throat> uh, when uh, let's discuss uh, cases animals, uh, I, when I the most part of my lecture, but unfortunately we lack an information. Uh, so uh, one case from Germany. It was a four-year-old rabbit, uh, and uh, during some months he had a di diarrhea and weight loss, uh, and he was without diagnosis. Uh, and when he died, they did an autopsy and uh, they found a multifocal nodules uh, in intestines and enlargement of mesenteric lymph, no lymph nodes. Uh, so we did uh, acid base stains uh, and it was positive, and when PCR, that was positive too. And uh, the last case report is uh, uh, about rabbit with pneumonia. Uh, which was caused by Mycobacterium genovense. Uh, this uh, rabbit was ju juvenile one, and uh, <clears throat> uh, he died with the symptoms of dyspnea. Uh, on autopsy, they found uh, granulomatose pneumonia, and they confirmed the diagnosis using acid fast uh, stains and PCR. And uh, uh, concurrently, this rabbit had. Uh, uh, multifocal scars uh, in the kidneys, and uh, he was positive uh, to, uh, to encephalitazone cuniculi. Uh, it is important dif differential diagnosis for us because we know that E. coli cuniculi infection uh, uh, also have a signs of granulomatose inflammation inside uh, brain, uh, kidneys, and all our organs. Ah, so, <clears throat> uh, for today we have only limited uh, case reports published, and uh, maybe it's our problem because we don't speak about this much. Um, rabbits can be a reservoir both for uh, atypical mycobacteria and for uh, human mycobacteria. Uh, it's important for us because uh, when we speak about uh, rabbit medicine, we should think about human medicine too. <clears throat> and uh, the main idea of my presentation was uh, uh, for us to remember that uh, uh, mycobacterial infection is possible in almost all mammals, not rabbits, so we should remember about this. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh.
uh, I would like to see a chat. Maybe we have a questions. Yep. My voice, uh, my voice now is much better. Yes, I can't uh, be without voice for two months. <laughs> Uh, okay, Marina, thank you very much. So if anyone has any questions, you still have like two minutes <laughs> to write them. Uh, uh, so maybe I will ask a question to Tatiana, is okay? Uh, Tatiana, do, do you see on a uh, daily basis uh, mycobacterial infection in reptiles? Because uh, I saw it uh, sometimes, not uh, really often in my practice. Uh, Tatiana, if you want, you can unmute yourself and try <laughs> speaking English. <laughs> <laughs> when? <laughs> okay, uh, очень is also good. <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana. So maybe next time <laughs> you can also speak. Thank you. It's really hard because I was invited Tatiana to our conferences and she is <laughs> in Russian. <laughs> well, um, imagine that this is practice. This is a good practice. Uh, so uh, this is the reason why we actually organize these conferences, not to, uh, you know, it's not like a huge international conference. It's more like a practice for you to uh, stop being shy here and maybe after that to go to something more serious and uh, be a presenter or a listener in an international conference in English. So uh, next time I invite everyone uh, again to maybe try and speak a little bit more. But um, I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, I really enjoyed your uh, speeches, even me, you know, as an English teacher. It was great. And um, to the listeners, I hope that our speakers inspired you to learn English and develop your professional skills. So if you are interested in um, finding out more, subscribe to their Instagram channels, ask them questions, and uh, follow them. And in uh, learning English, then message me and we will arrange a trial lesson for you. So thank you very much, uh, thank all you of you. For inviting um, my us. internet. Yusuf, carry on. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, it was a pleasure for me. <laughs> so my internet died like five times, so it was a little disaster, but thank God we finished. So uh, have a nice day, all of you, and uh, see you next time. Goodbye. Cheers.